quickly talk about Epistylus for a, a minute or two because you've you've triggered me and Ray. Oh, Ray <laughs> Sorry. Me. Uh, We've triggered so, ourselves. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's obviously what's well, often misdiagnosed between Vic and Epistylus. Uh, rightly or wrongly, I believe there's a, a website that confuses people a lot more than what it, it doesn't. Can you please explain some of the very, very obvious visual differences between the two? Yeah, so I think that, um, I think the biggest thing that I think about when people like, because the classic thing you see is like someone looks in their tank and they have a fish that has white spots on it. Mm -hmm. um, and um, really, like, you're not going to know if it's a stylus unless you take a mucus scrape and you look at it under, under a microscope. Now, you can have a pretty strong suspicion if you've been looking at a lot of fish with white spots and then you check it and you see, um, I think that there are like some small differences. But the thing that I think that like the average hobbyist should be focusing upon when they're looking at their fish that has white spots and they're like, oh my gosh, what's wrong with it? Did you recently introduce new fish to the tank? If you did, <laughs> it is probably ick because ick is like highly infectious. It's something that's going to like come in with new arrivals. Um, and then the other thing that of course triggers ick can be like, if there's like a sudden drop in water temperature um, and they got like a cold shock, that's like another reason that they can get ick, right? But there's usually like some kind of like um, sort of precipitating event, right? That, that like brought in um, ick or that like um, sort of like triggered it in the system. Um, epistylus is going to be something that you're more going to see like in an old established system maybe the fish has a wound on it from something else um i think um just to like do like a little bit of a generalization and not to say that you know this is definitively going to get it every time but when you have like really nicely defined white spots all over the fish you know that have like just recently appeared and whatever and a bunch of fish are breaking with it that's like your classic Ick, right? Like you put in an infected fish and then everybody in the tank starts getting it. Um, epistylus, I think, tends to be more of this like slow moldering um, thing where you, you like look one day and you're like, oh, it's got like this little kind of patch. Oh, gosh, now it's bigger. Oh, no, another one. Ha you know, and it kind of like continues along. And so that's sort of like the... Um, the things that I think instead of people focusing on like whether the dots are like raised or flat or on the eye or on the tail or whatever, just think about like, did you do something to your tank that could have made them get ick? <laughs> or is this like an old established tank that maybe you haven't been doing enough water changes on? And do we have epistylus going? And then kind of at the end of the day, I don't know that it matters so much because if you do like three PPT salt in there and just kind of let it go, hopefully that should deal with both of them. Sometimes it might not deal with ick, um, but um, but I think, but yeah, it's. I mean, it's an interesting thing. I the, people get really excited, and I never even like. I laugh because like Jen showed me like some incredible arguments about ick versus epistylus. It never would have crossed my mind to even <laughs> like you know kind of conflate those two things together. <laughs> yeah, it's um. Yeah, it's, it's really unfortunate because um, it does get people, again, focused on, oh, is it this or is it that, when really they need to be looking at what, yeah, what's the context, you know, and that's what we always try to zoom out to. Um, what's the context of what's happening, all the things that Nora mentioned. Um, and end of the day, um, you know, it is kind of an emergency in your tank. Like as soon as you see that, hopefully you're detecting it early if you've got good practices to observe your fish. Um, epistylus when we would see that in our systems like okay there it is again like we'll deal with it but it wasn't a panic drop everything deal with it we got a disaster like at all it was just mm -hmm. like like a chronic sort of thing that you know you just need to deal with you know it's but um yeah it's it's really unfortunate and you know the idea that you could visually differentiate it um just based on you know these certain factors it just doesn't hold water um, because, you know, many different fish species will um, have a different reaction to ectoparasites on their skin that may look a little bit different between them. Um, and so there's just not, you know, some uniform thing. Well, and even like, I'm just thinking about, um, you know, we had your friend's fish that you were sending me some pictures of. And I was, I was like, I was like, oh yeah, you know, here I am. This is why I won't 
diagnose things over pictures for anyone because I'm like, oh yeah, that's got to be columnaris. You know, it has these nice like skin lesions. You know, they're like patches. I thought they looked a little yellow in the picture. And then you actually took the fish, preserved them, sent them to our lab. And my boss looked at them because he's like a veterinary pathologist and they had mycobacterium. So, yeah. I mean, it is... <laughs> Yeah, and we, just goes to show. Yeah, that's, we, had, we were not expecting that at all. That wasn't even on our list of possibilities, right? So, yeah. Um, so just, just on the uh, NEP, uh, people are misconception or conception of temperature changes the result of both of them. Raising temperature to speed up the ick cycle can then also make epistylus more deadly. Is the truth in that um, conception? So ick um, does, so it has a, a life cycle where, and this is actually kind of interesting, so maybe we'll get into this. Um, it has a life cycle where it's like um, insisted, you know, let's say like, I don't know, in the gravel, um, and then it hatches, it swims off, and then penetrates into the fish's like gills and um, under the skin. And it's really incredible. Like when you look at it under the microscope, and you can see YouTube videos of this, it's like rolling around in there, like swimming around. I mean, it causes a lot of damage. Um, and then, of course, this poor fish, you know, it has holes poked in all of its like protective layer from the outside. So it's getting like, you know, inundated with water and stuff. Um, and it opens like avenues for like other things like bacteria. Um, but, um, you know, it's under the skin and then it kind of goes uh, under a developmental um, cycle in there. And then it basically like pops back out, swims around and turns into the cyst. And so one of the hardest things about ick, and Jen talks about this really nicely and something we did on our website, um, you can't treat it at all stages when it's like insisted. And then when it's under the skin of the fish, it's, it's protected. So it's hard to um, kill it. And that's why, you know, you have to have like a certain length of the treatment and the um, speed at which it progresses through its life cycle is dependent upon the water temperature. So um, you basically, and there's a nice chart um, on Dr. Roy Yanong's, he has an extension publication, you know, that we mentioned earlier about ick. Um, but there's a nice chart that walks through like at this water temperature, this is how many days it completes ick or how many days it takes ick to complete its life cycle. And so that tells you like how long you have to treat it for, because you basically have to treat it long enough that it's gone through all of the stages so that you can nuke it. Um, so, so that is true that if you were to increase the water temperature, it would go through the life cycle more quickly. I don't know that you have to do that. I mean, if you have like your effective, um, you know, dose of salt or copper or whatever you're using there, you know, it should work. Um, as far as epistylus, um, I, I have a feeling that what that has to do with is the fish's immune system. And what's so interesting about fish is that fish, um, so like mammals, okay, so like <laughs> I just had COVID, <laughs> um, I was getting a fever <laughs> because, you know, your body induces a fever to basically like make the virus less able to replicate fish can't do that because they live at the at the temperature of the water that they're in there's a really cool study for anyone that's interested about goldfish um inducing fever in themselves by mm. giving them the choice of being able to swim into different water temperatures when they i don't remember what they infected them with i think it might have been a wow. virus and they could choose like different chambers to swim into and they actually would swim into the hotter chamber and sit there when they were infected because you know the virus couldn't replicate as well there and for whatever reason yeah it's it's a cool it's a really cool paper but oh. um alternatively um and you have this with like a number of different viruses um like koi herpes virus is a great example spring viremia of carp both of these affects um carp and then one affects goldfish um, you will see disease with it at certain temperatures and fish can be infected with some of these viruses at other water temperatures and have no clinical signs and be perfectly fine. So what I suspect with epistylus is that if you're jacking up the water temperature and it's a, too high and the fish are like, you know, stressful for the fish to be at that higher temperature, that might compromise the fish's immune system and it can't fight off the um the epistylus as well. It also could be that the parasite likes the higher temperature, but that's something like, especially with fish, is to not just think about the, you know, the environment and and the pathogen, but also like the fish's body and immune system itself, because they're so um, 
dependent upon water temperature and then also like um the um you know the quality of the water around them and the, the hygiene and stuff like that to fight stuff off so it's like a fish immunity is really fascinating <laughs> All right, and I've got one follow-up question, and we've got a whole lot of questions that have come through on the chat. You've both <laughs> mentioned salt for both of these treatments. How does salt work when it comes to both Nick and Epistylus? So um, salt basically, um, and it so Ick and Epistylus are like small single-celled organisms. Um, and so they're like particularly susceptible to the osmotic disruption that salt causes. So like when you salt the water, they're going to have a harder time um, like keeping their own like single cell <laughs> floating in this salty bath intact. Um, you know, the fish can tolerate that a little bit more because the fish is like a bigger organism. They have like the, the gill chloride cells. They have um, the salt excretion system like through their urinary tract. So they kind of have a whole setup to be able to handle salt better than um, these really small organisms do. And that's why salt works on things like, so um, both of those are parasites. Um, it can work on bacteria. Um, and then um, it can also work on like, you know, like water molds. So like fu um, fungus, it's not fungus, but people like to call it that. And so that's sort of what it does. Um, yeah, I think I'll leave it there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I could, I could just add to that. Um, my experience it, with using so much salt over the years. And I was saying to Nora, you know, one of our recent conversations was it still, even after all those years, it still kind of shocks me when I weigh out and measure, okay, like here's the amount of salt that I'm going to put in this tank. It's like, it's a lot, you know, visually. Um, and I think it it's a little scary for people, especially if you're newer and you don't have the experience. Yeah, I've done this before. I've seen fish get through it. I'm not going to be hurting my fish right now. Um, so, you know, you can get the amount like calculated. We actually have, you know, we're working on some more resources, but have some resources on our site to help people with that. Um, and you can just add it slowly too, right? You can just solve the brine in, just add a bit like over 12 hours even, like if that makes you more comfortable. Um, the other thing that I used to use all the time to the point I, I even wrote my name on it so nobody would, would steal it from me at the aquarium um, was a low level salinity meter just a great tool. Like if you've got multiple tanks and you're going to be using this, um, just awesome. You can just dip it in, get a reading right away. Um, cause it's a little harder to get an accurate reading at that, those low levels, um, you know, with something like a refractometer or, or what's commonly used for, you know, saltwater aquariums. So yeah. that's a great tool for the serious uh, freshwater aquarists is to have that low level salinity meter really commonly it's used. Not that much on Amazon. <laughs> not that, yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, if you've got a pond, I mean, people are using that all the time. Um, so I'm not going to lie, I've totally geeked out over that last 15 minutes worth of conversation, and thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> and I'm sure that um, there'll be a lot of people that have just listened to that or listened to that following up later today that will have their mind opened and blown a little bit. So thank you very much for that. That was fantastic.